If you have been a part of the workplace for any length of time, you no doubt have come across coworkers that have been, well, less than stellar in their performance. Whether it was their lack of performance or maybe just their lack of attendance. They didn't even show up at work. Or when they did show up, they were so grossly late. Truth is, when we interact with such coworkers, hoping it's not us that we're thinking about, we are caught sometimes between feeling bad for them if they come from a bad environment, a bad experience, a bad home, a bad night, a bad body, whatever it might be, or we feel bad for us. We have to work with them. Employees, eventually, that are so incompetent in their work need to be relieved of their work. The company has a responsibility, and it's not to do charity as its primary responsibility. Some examples of employees who needed to be let go of that I don't think anybody here in this room would debate. In 2015, a cashier at Taco Bell in Roswell, Georgia, was caught not only passing out the food that people paid for, but also before returning their credit cards, capturing the credit card information so that she could spend her own spending spree later on. In 2015, the same year, a few employees of a British multinational bank were having a, you know, corporate gathering, an outing, a morale-boosting opportunity to be together, you know, build a sense of team unity. They went out to go ride go-karts together. That was so much fun for them. They decided at that, sta- at that place to stage a mock ISIS beheading and show how they'd grown together as a team. That led to some people losing their jobs. 2016, Joaquin Garcia received an award in Spain for 20 years of faithful, faithful work as a manager at a wastewater treatment facility in Spain. 20-year pin, 20 years of being acknowledged. The problem, he hadn't shut up for work in the last six years. He had figured out a way to kind of hack the system and have his attendance be noted and keep collecting paychecks for six years. The worst, in my opinion, three employees at a daycare in Delaware, they were arrested after they had tried to make the toddlers not learn their ABCs and their one, two, threes, but how to take their toddlers that had been entrusted to them and turn them into a fight club where they actually taught the toddlers how to fight each other There's actually a video of this being captured, and on the video you could hear one of the employees saying, no, no, no pinching, just punching. He used to say they were let go. I can imagine how you feel differently about those employees' stories based upon where they worked and or what they're responsible for. A Taco Bell employee who's stealing credit card information? Okay, that's not good. That's not good. A daycare worker entrusted with your children, teaching them to be bullies and to be a part of a toddler fight club? Okay, that's really not good. That's bad. But what if your employer wasn't a company but God? And what if your responsibility was not making food but telling people that God is going to judge them, but he can and will forgive them if they repent? What if you're an employee of that arrangement, but you refuse? You don't just refuse to show up for work, let alone to show up for work and do a bad job. You refuse to go to work, and instead you want to take a cruise and go on vacation in the opposite direction. Well, that's what we're dealing with this morning at Grace Church. The title of our sermon is, How Not to Do Your Job. And to learn that, let me ask you to turn to the book of Jonah. Jonah chapter 1. Now, a numbers of you, not all of you, numbers of you are familiar with the book of Jonah because we have been going through the book of Jonah in a lot of our community groups on Wednesday nights. We originally had thought as pastors about having the community group uh, calendar match the Wednesday, the Sunday morning calendar, that was not possible, and we wanted to have the entire fall be in the minor prophets, not all the minor prophets, but two of them, Hosea and Jonah. In doing so, 
In Hosea, as we learn as a summary from last week, we wanted to see that God's persevering love is seen for the people of God. Even though the people of God are not the most attractive people to keep loving, God continues to pursue them and love them with his covenantal love. In the book of Jonah, we see God's profound grace for people who are not God's people. So whether it's God's unbelievable love for the people that are his, or God's profound grace for the people who are not his, both of these accounts are shown to us in the lives of interesting prophets. Hosea, it's his marriage. His marriage is radical. The man's married to a prostitute who goes back to being a prostitute. But Jonah, it's not his marriage, it's himself. We don't look to Gomer to find the sad story. We just simply look to Jonah. Now, for our next four times together in the book of Jonah, let me kind of just give you a sense of overview of these four chapters. If you're not familiar with the book of Jonah, maybe you're new to the Bible, investigating Christianity here, you are welcome here. And I'm so glad for you to be here. We do have Bibles for you for free at the Welcome Center. You're welcome to take one of those as a gift for you, as a resource that you might have, be able to read a copy that's understandable. Uh, I'm going to be reading this morning out of Jonah chapter 1. But for an outline of Jonah, let me sort of summarize it for you like this. Jonah chapter 1 and 2 shows the following. Jonah runs and God saves. Jonah chapter 3 and 4, Jonah preaches and God saves. No matter what Jonah does, God saves. Why? Because we see in Jonah chapter 2, salvation is of the Lord. Now, the question is, who is this man that the book is named after? This Jonah, as we see in Jonah chapter 1, verse 1. Now, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai. Who is this Jonah? Well, interestingly, he is a prophet around the time of Hosea. We are familiar with the book of Hosea. We went through that for a number of weeks together. And Hosea has got a message for the people of Israel Jonah had previously had a message for the people of Israel, prophesied during the time of Jeroboam II, and his message was seemingly a successful one, as we can see in 2 Kings. But while we learn a lot about Jonah through this book, we're also going to learn a lot about God. And it's with that in mind, I want to kind of direct us to the first lesson we're going to learn, the calling of God. Now let's go to the chapter 1 and read it in its entirety. Jonah chapter 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. And he went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with him to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea. And there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and they each cried out to his God, and they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had lain down and was fast asleep. So the captain came and said to him, What do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give a thought to us that we may not perish. They said to one another, Come, let us cast lots, that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, Tell us on what, on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? And of what people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew. And I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. And the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, What is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord, because he had told them. Verse 11. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may, be quiet, sea may quiet down for us? For the sea grew more and more tempest. And he said to them, Pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Nevertheless, 
The men rode hard to get back to dry land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more tempest against them. Therefore they called out to the Lord, O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not on us innocent blood for you. O Lord, have done us, done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. We'll stop there. First of all, we see the calling of God in these verses. In verse 2, you see this coming out clearly. Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city. Now, this is not uncommon for God to raise up people, raise up men to be his ambassadors, to be his representative, to be his spokesman. We have a history of this in our account here of different prophets, both by name and the account of the Old Testament, as well as even by reference. It's time to go, Jonah. I'm sending you to a people. Where? Where is it that God is sending Jonah? He says, arise, go to Nineveh, that great city. Now, let me just kind of give you a sense of understanding of the city of Nineveh, from where Jonah is to where he's told to go to where he wants to go instead. So Jonah is in Jerusalem. He's living under the time of Jeroboam II, a king, and he's been had a fruitful ministry already, but now the Lord says, I want you to go to Nineveh, this reference to this great city. Now, Nineveh would have been the capital city of Assyria, so if we say the capital of the United States, we could think of Washington, D.C. We think about the capital of France, we think of Paris. We think about the capital of Spain, we think about Madrid. We think about capital cities. Assyria, excuse me, Nineveh was the capital city for Assyria. It's about 500 miles northwest of where he's at. Northeast, rather, of where he's at. That's where he's supposed to go. It's in the modern-day area of Iraq. Now, this city is no small city both in its population and in its sort of reputation. Its population is debatable. At the very end of Jonah chapter 4, you have this reference to 120,000 who did not know their left hand from the right hand. The question is, is that a reference to the population of the people? They're, they're that ignorant, they don't know. Or is that a reference to the population of their children themselves that they don't know? Therefore, if that's their children, the population of adults could be as high as up as high as a million. But here's what we know about the city. They took battle seriously. When they built a town, they built a wall. And I'm not just talking like a small wall. I'm talking a wall that was at, at its longest part, seven and a half miles long, a hundred feet high, up to 50 feet wide at the top. The reputation of this city's wall was that you could race three chariots around the top of the wall, like its own like drag racing just going on, just around the top. It was that legitimately thick, formidable. Like, okay, so that's impressive. They know how to build walls. It's not just they're great by the reputation of their size and their construction projects. It's great as because the reputation of how wicked they were. Their wickedness was legendary. When the Syrians went to battle, they were not nice. When they came into a city that they opposed and overran them, they overran them in barbaric ways. They would take numbers of the population of the people and behead them, stack their heads in a pyramid at the beginning of their town as a monument that we have conquered these people. They would drag other people from the town back to their own place to make them slaves. To show their dominance, they would punch holes through the chin in their throat, running a rope up through their mouth, tying them together in a string as they would drag them through town to show them that they're nothing more than wild animals to be treated accordingly. These are the Assyrians. Nineveh is their capital. And God says to Jonah, I want you to go preach to them. And Jonah euphemistically basically says, over my dead body. I'm not going to do that. There's not a chance in the world I'm going to do that. Now, you have to understand something. 
The story of Jonah is not just a story of a rogue prophet. It's a story of a racist people. Jonah had the sentiment of the Israelites as a nation. That this is how the Israelites thought of other people. Especially people who were prophesied to overrun them as a people. The last thing these people deserve is grace. The last thing these people deserve is salvation. So while Jonah easily makes a punching bag for us to say, what was that guy thinking? How could you tell that to God? Friends, the Lord, through the servant Jonah, is saying something to the entire people of Israel, just like the Lord is saying something to the entire people of Israel through the marriage of Hosea and Gomer. God has a calling on Jonah's life. It says in verse 2, he wants Jonah to call out against that city, for their evil has come up before me. They are known to the Lord, they are known around the world, and they ruled for a long time. To give you a sense of how large and in charge Assyria was, they ruled for over 1,700 years. 1,700 years, just to get an understanding of what that would mean by practical comparison. To rule for 1,700 years, that means the United States in its present sort of superpower status would need to maintain our status until the year 3,476 to compare to the kind of military superpower of Assyria. Just a sneak peek, or I don't think that's going to happen. Assyrians were large and charge, wicked and wild. And God tells Jonah, I want you to go preach to them. Jonah doesn't want to do that. Because here's why. Jonah has an implicit understanding of where his obedience to the Lord starts and stops. It's at the condition of comfort or conviction. Or I'm comfortable with what you're asking me, or conviction, I believe in what you're telling me to do. Comfort or conviction becomes the implied governor on Jonah's obedience to the Lord. Friend, <laughs> we don't have to be a prophet in Israel to know that that's a problem for us even today. So often the temptation for us is to say to the Lord, Lord, here I am. I am your servant. I will do whatever you ask me to do. Lead me, guide me, direct me. I am yours. And it is as if we somehow have like asked the lawyers to help us with a small print. And we have a bunch of small print wording on what we will and will not do, where we will and will not go, who we will and will not love, where we will and will not serve. Jonah is at times embarrassing, not for what we learn about him, but what it exposes us about ourselves. At times it feels like we're reading an autobiography. How often are we tempted to say, I will serve the Lord where I will want to serve the Lord, and then use phrases like, well, the Lord's called me, as in a chance to get out of that. Here's a principle that I want to teach you, and I hope you can remember in the days ahead People often want to know, where is the Lord calling me to serve? What is God calling to me to do? Here's the principle. Where the need and your capacity meet, there you will find your calling. Where the need and your capacity meet, that intersection, that's where you can find the calling that God has for you. Now, what we see here in the text is that God's calling upon Jonah was one that made him profoundly uncomfortable, which explains what happens next. He takes off, which leads us secondly from the calling of God to now the sovereignty of God. Look at verse three. Jonah rose and fled to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and he went down into it to go with them to Tarshish. Now, to give you understanding, because it's like, 
Today, if I'm talking about Tarsus, you're like, oh, yeah, Tarsus. I have no clue what that is, Eric. I have like, no clue. Where is Tarsus? So just to understand, if, if he's got us supposed to go to Nineveh, that's 500 miles this direction. Jonah's like, got it. He pays for a fare to get on a boat to go to Tarsus 2,500 miles this direction. I mean, he is like, I see your calling, and I reverse it the opposite direction. He could not be more committed. He's not just saying, I'm not leaving. He's saying, I'm not, I'm not going. He's saying, I'm going the opposite direction. The very thing you want me to do, I'm not going to do. I want you to see this reoccurring phrase that comes up, because it's a theme here in chapter 1. It comes up twice in verse 3, and it comes up again in verse 10. Verse 3, Jonah rose to flee, what? From the presence of the Lord. End of verse 3. To go from the Tarshish, what? Away from the presence of the Lord. Verse 10. The men are even acknowledging this. These, these non-Hebrew men. For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord. How badly do you have to love your sin that you'd rather have that than the presence of the Lord? That's the question you and I have to ask ourselves this morning. How badly do you and I have to love our sin that we'd rather have that, keep that, hold that, than have the presence of the Lord? Because Jonah was that committed to his sin. He was that committed. He was not going to obey even if it meant he had to flee from the presence of the Lord. Now, the two most common games for children to play are what? Hide and seek and tag. Hide and seek and tag. You know this. If you've ever played hide and seek with a child or tag, they both have the same sort of comedic effect, right? You'd like play with a three-year-old. A three-year-old, when they play hide and seek, has somehow this thought that if they can't see you, you can't see them. Right? You know this. And their hiding is horrible. I mean, we love it because they're adorable and they're cute. But, you know, they, they get in the couch, they hide underneath the pillows. The pillows are bulging now. The leg is sticking out the side. And they're convinced, like absolutely convinced, there's no way you're going to find them. And you play along and act like you don't see them. But then you finally, oh, sit back in the couch, lean up against the pillows, reach behind you, oh, what's this? And then they giggle and they're like, oh, and they're shocked. How did you know that I was there? They're really like, how? I was convinced I had like the picture perfect place. And then that same child's like, okay, enough of the hide and seek, but you can't, if you can, if you can find me, but you can't catch me. So I'm going to play a game of tag and oh, how adorable they are. Their little stubby little legs running around as fast as they can. And they're convinced they cannot run you. And you kind of make a show of it. You're like, oh, I don't know, like the slumbering giant. Oh, how can I get to you? They're like, ah, they're giggling the whole way. But in one or two steps, boom, you could snatch that child and go, there you are. And you know what this is like? Because some of you are siblings, have younger kids, younger siblings, and you're like, I'm so tired of playing with my siblings. I do not want to play with them. I'm done playing with them. And so when they don't play, want we'll play tag, tag, done. <laughs> now let's play the silent game. That's my favorite one. You understand how ridiculous that is. Jonah, he wants to play a game with God. Let's play hide and seek. Let's play tag. But you can't catch me. But you can't find me. And God's like, are, are we really going to do this? You're, you're serious about this. Uh-huh. Because I'm not going to Nineveh. Look what happens in the text. Verse 4. The sovereignty of God here. The Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea. There's a mighty tempest on the sea that the ship threatened to break up. What's happening? This is God saying, Jonah, I see you. I see you. You know what this reminds me of? I have it here for you on the screen. Psalm 139, verses 7 through 12. The psalmist says, where shall I go from your spirit? Where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. 
If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. My friends, let's have a moment of honesty here together, shall we, as Christians? Jonah's foolishness is comical, but it's also very applicable. How often do we as Christians not struggle for knowing what the will of God is? It's pretty clear. We can read it. We can know it. We know God's will for our life. But we want to delay our obedience to it. And if not worse, even run from it. And we're trying to play hide and seek from God. And God is saying, are we really going to do this? Are you really going to try to hide from me? Where, where would you go? How would you hide? The Lord exercises sovereignty in the life of Jonah as he exercises sovereignty in the life of his people, you and me today. Ordaining events and circumstances that doesn't woo us back, it sometimes discipline us back. It's, what's striking to me is that what you don't see with the Lord here is that the Lord does not give a great weather report. Calm seas. Jonah knows, as he says later to the sailors, my God created all of this. He's responsible for all this. So Jonah is quite clear what God is capable of. He is capable of a beautiful sunrise and a crazy hurricane storm. And God does not choose to draw Jonah back by like, you know what, let me just, I see it, you're struggling, you're having a hard time, I'm going to be patient with you. You know what, that's fine. Let me just weave back. In fact, what he does is he makes Jonah's circumstances worse and worse and worse and worse. Why? Hebrews 12 tells us why. Because the Lord disciplines those whom he loves. Like a father does a child. That's to draw Jonah back. To bring Jonah to the end of himself. To show his sovereignty. It's not just an, ex an exercise in power. It's an exercise in relationship. To bring about obedience. What happens in this storm? Friends, it's so bad, professional sailors are thinking they're going to die. And even if they're not going to die, they would rather starve with the possibility of living as they're hurling cargo that's into the, on the ship into the sea, thinking maybe that'll save them. And they're just do, basically doing what these sort of multi-religious people are doing, this sort of polytheism of different gods, offering sacrifice, doing whatever they can, praying whatever they can, trying to cover all their bases. And then they cast lots. This casting of lots was a common way of decision-making at the time. A chance to see what deity says in the matter. The outcome is being determined by the means of normally what would be considered random rolling of dice is believing to be the reveal, revealing will of God. And what happens? The lot lands on Jonah. God controls the storm and the lots. Everything from small to great is under the control of God. Notice what happens. They want a conversation, and they come fast. You can imagine the panic. Friends, this is not like they're small grouping. Hey, let's uh, sit around, a cup of tea, a cup of coffee. Let's talk about why you think uh, we might die here today. Um, things are not looking good. Uh, half of our cargo is overseas. Uh, we've thrown it overboard. Uh, at the rate we're going, we're probably going to be dead before uh, sunrise. Uh, we just want to talk about it with you. Sorry to interrupt your nap. Looks like you're sleeping pretty well. Wish we could do that, but we're not feeling that good ourselves. No, friends, they're in a full-on panic. And you could just sort of hear these questions. Look how these questions come. What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? What people are you? Oh, man. This is full on just conviction. You're like, every one of these questions convicts me. The moment I tell the truth, I'm exposed. I mean, what's he going to say? Um, I tell people to listen to the Lord what are you doing? Not listening to the Lord. How's that going for you? I don't know. You guys tell me. 
I think you're caught with me. I'm the problem here, not you. It's not the storm, it's not the sea, it's not a random chance. God is purposely doing something in this moment. And his explanation is followed by their confrontation. Look at what they say. They are actually appealing to him to pray. What is it? Why are you not even saying anything? Jonah says, pick me up. Throw me overseas. Throw me overboard, rather, into the sea. And look at what happens here in verse 9. As he describes in verse 9, I am a Hebrew. I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. And then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, what is it that you have done for the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord. Since this God of yours controls the sea, verse 9, what can we do to get him to calm the sea? The answer, Jonah is saying, basically, toss me as an offering. Distance yourself from me and all of my consequences. They tried alternatives. Look at verse 13. They tried everything they could. It was not working. They could not. The sea grew more and more tempest against them. The act of prayer doesn't stop, but their audience does. Look how they change. What ends up happening here in their prayer? They're generically praying to any of these deities. As it says in verse 6, perhaps the God will give thought to us that we may not perish. Each crying out to his God, verse 5. But now the prayers don't stop, but the audience of the prayer does. Verse 14. They called out to the Lord. Oh, Lord, let us not perish for this man's life. And lay not on us innocent blood. For you, oh, Lord, have done as it pleased you. Wow. Wow. Okay. For those of you who are not Christians here, I got to tell you something that's super humbling for me as a Christian is to have someone like you, who's not a Christian, know enough about God from the Bible, having heard it, maybe you grew up in the church, or you've had it explained to you from other Christians, bring to a Christian's attention something about God that the Christian is not living in light of. You're basically saying, hey, if you claim you're a Christian, you ought to act like one. Because the last time I checked, Christians had been forgiven by God. Christians were, had been loved by God. Well, you don't seem to be very forgiving yourself. You don't seem to be very loving yourself. That seems inconsistent with me with what you tell me about who God is. That is remarkably humbling. And here, the non-Christians are reminding Jonah of the sovereignty of God. This Lord, he does whatever he pleases. Whatever he pleases. For those of you who are not Christians, let me just remind you of this important principle. Never base Christianity on the representation or the misrepresentation of Christianity based on the disciples of Christ. Base it on the teachings of Christ. So let me ironically explain to you what I mean by that. For those of you who are not Christians, you need to understand something very, very clearly. It is not your good works that will save you, that you can gain peace or forgiveness with God. It is only God's gift of his son, Jesus Christ, the perfect son of God, the only sacrificial person that could qualify, having obeyed all of God's law, having been born in the likeness of us, having fulfilling the law, and then laid down his life as a sacrifice for the forgiveness of sins, that all those who would believe in him would be forgiven, having been crucified, buried, resurrected three days later, appearing to more than 500 witnesses, more than in this room right now, over the span of a number of days, and then ascended be the right hand of the Father, promising to return again. The only way you could ever have peace and forgiveness with God is by faith in his Son. Now, you might think, if that's true, then why do I see in Christians things that I think are not that gracious, not that loving, not that merciful, not that kind? Because if anything, sadly, you are being reminded by the very teaching that you're learning about that there is truth only perfectly found in Christ, not even followers of Christ 
who themselves have got to be reminded of the gospel regularly. Of why they're saved by faith in Christ alone, not in grace, or not in works at all. This is profoundly important. These non-Hebrews know something about the Lord that Jonah seems to be forgiving. Verse 13. So they picked up Jonah. They hurled him into the sea. And the sea ceased from its raging. The response, the men feared the Lord exceedingly. And they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. They were scared for their lives when there was a storm. They're even more scared for their life when the storm was calmed. Because they realized this entire time any of the other beliefs were wrong. And there was only one true God. And he controls the lots and he controls the storm. And he controls everyone's life in between. And the question was whether or not they're going to respond to him. Now, what's ridiculous to see here, an ironic lesson, I'm reminded back to verse 3. Look at what it says in verse 3. How Jonah, what does it say there? He says, he paid the fare and went down into it, going down to the ship to go to Tarshish. I'm reminded of what Pastor Donald Barnhouse once said. He said the following, quote, when you run away from the Lord, you never get to where you are going, and you always pay, pay your own fare. But when you go the Lord's way, you always get to where you are going, and he pays the fare. Jonah paid the fare. It nearly cost him his life. He didn't get anywhere. There's four ironic lessons we can see from this. First of all, Jonah is called on to worship by non-Hebrews. Look at verse 6 again. The captain came and said to him, What do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give a thought to us that we may not perish. Who's having to get Jonah to get up and to respond to the Lord in prayer? The person doesn't even know God. How bad does your pursuit of sin have to be that you have to be called back by non-Christians? Secondly, that's verse 6. Secondly, Jonah didn't lack for theology. Look at what he says in verse 9. Verse 9, and he said to them, I am a Hebrew, I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Jonah did not lack for theology. Instead, he lacked for obedience. There is a lot of very well-taught Christians who know the Bible really, really well. But his lives do not reflect that. And faith and obedience and desire to come out from the world and not be like the world. Never mistake knowing about God for obeying God. You need the former, knowing God, to do the latter, obeying God. But you cannot claim the former, knowing God, in place of the latter, obeying God. It's not enough. Third, now if in verse 6 and verse 9, now we move to verse 12. Jonah would offer himself. Think about this. Jonah would offer himself. He says, hey, throw me over. Jonah would offer himself so that the ship full of men might live, but he would not offer himself so that an entire city of people might live. Is that remarkable or what? He was that stubbornly committed to his will. I mean, how much do you have to hate someone before you won't evangelize them? Fourth, the final, Jonah did not fear the Lord as much as the pagan sailors did, verse 16. They feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. This is a radical story, and this is only the first installment of it. It's a story about Jonah. It's a story about a people of Israel, and it's a story about the people of God loving other people 
who are not the people of God. I would be remiss if I did not ask you to consider somebody in your life who you think is outside the grace that you have otherwise received. They do not deserve it for what they have done to you or to others, for what they have said, for where they have gone, for what they have committed. I can assure you, by comparison, and I don't mean this to make light of any difficult situation you've been in or any difficult relationship you've been a part of, I can assure you, whatever that is, they would, by comparison, be small in comparison to the wickedness of the Assyrians. And God is saying to Jonah, he wants to show grace to them. Can he be God and do that? And the truth is, by temptation, we would rather God be gracious to us and not as much to others unless we get to selectively choose who that grace is to. And yet the grace of God is undeniable in Jonah's life because God saves, not first, Nineveh. He saves Jonah. So maybe that's where we begin and where we're there we'll end. It's not to consider the salvation of others. It's to consider your own. How has God's saving of you changed you, compelled you, shaped you by that gospel truth to learn to love others that you otherwise feel like it would be impossible for you to love? 